Three respectful bows to our speaker. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Thank you. Please be seated. Good evening, our distinguished speaker, Venerable Chuan respected Venerable, Dhamma friends, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the two days Dhamma talk, hosted by Lin Chang Swami Monastery, together with Leng Fong Pratyar Temple, Huang Hua Buddhist Monastery, Buddha of Denison Welfare Society, Zudo An Temple, Fushan Temple, and Buddhi Buddhist Temple. Today we have the pleasure and honor of introducing and having with us Venerable Chuan Kwan from, from Canada. Born in Hong Kong, the Venerable was a graduate from the University of Toronto and formerly a certified management accountant in Canada. In 1981, he founded the International Buddhist Temple in Richmond, BC in Canada. Today, the temple has become a landmark of Mahayana Buddhism and traditional Chinese architecture. In 2010, again the Venerable established the Vinaya Samadhi and Prajna Lecture Hall in Hong Kong for the sake of carrying out the Dhamma propagation and charitable projects in Southeast Asia. In 2013, the Venerable founded the Bowen Forest Monastery on Bowen Island, BC in Canada, having authored several articles and books in both English and Chinese. The Venerable has inspired and benefited many people. His topic today will be on practicing near consciousness is the start of a happy life. We shall now invite Venerable to give us a speech. Thank you. Please repeat after me. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato sama sam buddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato sama sam buddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Please put your palms down. Good evening, dear venerables, brothers and sisters and devotees, ladies and gentlemen, and I can see some boys and girls here too, so... Uh, good evening. Um, the the talk, the Dharma talk today, um, will be in two sessions. Today and tomorrow. And the two sessions will be basically split into two parts. The first day today, we're looking at understanding the theory, the philosophy. Understanding the philosophy, the theory, and tomorrow will be how to practice it. So theory and practice go together. Uh, we can also say that today is understanding Buddhism. Buddhism, and then tomorrow will be apply Buddhism. Um, it is very important that we know how to apply Buddhism. 
Because if just talk about a theory, it's like the the wings of a bird. You need two wings to fly. You can't just have one wing. So today's talk, the Dharma talk content, uh, the first day, how does the mind work? Mere consciousness is an English translation for a particular Buddhist school of thought. Which is called Mujnana Matratata. It's a Sanskrit word. And if you translate it, it's consciousness only. Consciousness only. So that means everything originates from a thought. So usually, many people believe, when they believe in Buddhism, the traditional approach is to request. I request uh, blessings from Bodhisattvas. I request protection, security from the Buddha. Everything is to request. But if you're always requesting and wanting, isn't that increasing your desire? Your desire is to want more. Uh, I remember there was a very famous philosopher in China, Lao Tzu, and he said uh, in, in, the, in the Chinese language, "Wei Xue." What's the meaning of it? In the, in the temporal world, when you want to learn something, understand something, you acquire, you want more, you want more knowledge, you want more understanding. But to practice Buddhism is you let go. You let go of it. You don't want more, you just let go of it. So letting go and wanting more is just the opposite. But let's first of all understand how the mind works. In order to study mere consciousness, we have to know how the thought comes about. How does the thought rise up? Can we manage our thoughts? Mere consciousness is the management of your thought. We manage a company, we manage a family, we manage, or you may be able to manage your life, uh, how do you manage it, we don't know. Some people manage it in the wrong way, wrong management in the company, or even in family, and sometimes in the international management that is wrong would stir up disputes and wars. So management is very important. Now, how does the mind work? Before we know the management of it, we have to understand how it works. How does the mind work? Which is actually our mental experience. If you understand yourself in Chinese Buddhism, if you know if you know your mind, if you know your mind really well, there is not an inch of the world that you don't understand. 大地无穿逃,大地无穿逃你不知道的. It is absolutely important that you know your own mind. Because whatever the mind can conceive, the mind can carry out. So we will spend some time in understanding how the mind works. And then we have to understand the front end five sensory consciousnesses. What are the front end? We, call it, we usually call it in our body, we call it the front end salesman and sales lady. What are the front end sensor organs? The eyes, the nose, the ears, the tongue, the body, and the brain. The front end. Third, the managerial mind consciousness. Yish. The front end salesman has to be supervised and managed by the brain inside. So there's a, there's a manager. So the sixth consciousness, the front end are the five consciousness. The eyes consciousness, the ear consciousness, the nose, the tongue, and the body. And that's, those are the five front end. And then behind this front end, you can see it, but it's inside. That is the managerial mind consciousness, which manage 
the front end salesman. Now imagine that you are your body is is nothing but a company. It, it's just it's at a it's just a Harvard business study. Apply Buddhism. It's just a Harvard business study case. The front end salesman has to be controlled by the managerial mind consciousness, which is the mano consciousness in the Sanskrit language. Sanskrit is the classical Indian language, translated into uh, into um, Chinese is mano, mano, which nana, which nana means consciousness. And then the fourth item that we're going to venture into it is the personal ego consciousness, which is the seven manas consciousness, the manas consciousness. I call it the personal because. Your ego, your ego personalizes everything. That's where the problems come up. You personalize everything you see. You always see things with your own glass, your own spectacles inside of you, which is tainted with your own opinion. So if you you have to know how your ego works, how your ego attach, and how how your ego personalizes everything. The fifth is the limitless storage consciousness. Which we call the eighth consciousness is the alaya consciousness, the alaya which nana. What is the alaya which nana? The alaya which nana is like the, the the bank's teller. It receives everything you store into it. All the bad thoughts, all the good thoughts, all the kind thoughts, compassionate thoughts, a thought of anger, a thought of depression, a thought of jealousy, hatred. When it comes up, it's a store in there. It becomes an energy stored into a lie consciousness. It's just like the, a teller banking consciousness. That is the eighth consciousness. That consciousness is responsible for reincarnation. Some people always come up with a question to me. This and he said, Reverend,、uh, when we die, where do we go? Do we have a soul? Do we go somewhere with a soul? If we don't have a soul. How can we go? Any? How can you reincarnate? That's responsible for the reincarnation. The eighth alaya consciousness. You have to understand it. The sixth component of the of today's talk is concomitant wholesome and unwholesome mental functions. What is concomitant? Spontaneously, when a thought comes up, spontaneously there are many mental functions. That come up with it at the same time. You may not realize it. You have 51 mental functions working in your own mind. Everybody, and if you understand those 51 mental functions, you can manage the company of your body, the company of your mind. The seventh would be karma, sufferings versus happiness. Why do I put the seven component into today's talk? Because right now your body, sensory organs, right now are the experiences of the temporal world at the present moment. At the present moment, I see you, I hear you, I I can touch. That's the present moment, the creation of the present moment consciousness. Your eyes cannot create consciousness of yesterday, can you? Can your eyes see yesterday? No, you cannot. Can your ears listen to yesterday's? No. Can your nose smell yesterday's food? No. Can your tongue taste yesterday's taste? You cannot. So that means our karma. We have present karma、um, created by your present consciousness. There is also a very important factor that. Many people ignore to understand your past karma. You don't exist in just one life. Usually, the, when the Buddha look at the time dimensions, it's not just today. It's not just yesterday. It's not just two years ago, three years ago. What is the most recent past of your life? What is the most? What is the the past? The most. Remote past of your present life, when you were born, when you were born as a baby, that's the, when you dropped into this world. 
And when you, when you look back, that is your very obvious past. And now it's the present. And in, in the future, if you're going to live, you, it will be future. So when the Buddha look at time dimensions, it's the past, the present, and the future. But that's not just, that's not enough. When the Buddha tells us the time, he says, you are not of just the present life. You have a previous life, thousands of years. And in your previous life, what do you do? You committed karma. You also ate, you also spoke, you also did all kinds of things that you are doing now similarly. And when you are doing all these past deeds, what do you do? You are creating energy in the past. You agree? You're creating energy in the past. You think all the energy you create in the past disappear? Dissipated? You never see it again? Energy never, never disintegrate. It just changed form. That's proven by the scientists. Energy would not just be, oh, no more energy, no. Energy would never, never be disintegrated. It changes its form. It's just like when you throw a stone into the, into the pond. The ripple, there's a ripple effect coming out, coming out. The energy is transforming, 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 transforming into the land. It still has energy. And the energy, the karmic energy that we created in the past, they won't get disappeared. You brought those energies into this present life. The fact that you were very compassionate in your past life, you were very helpful, you were a philanthropist, you donated your whole estate to build a hospital, to build schools, you have done so much good deeds, those good energy carried into this life, maybe you were a billionaire, you have good health. So whatever you are facing, you're experiencing, is whatever, whatever you have done in the past, not God. You are responsible for your own actions, your speech, your thought. So it's very dangerous if you don't know how you think, how you act, how you speak. You've got to be very careful with how you behave. It's very logical. It's nothing about superstition, nothing about Buddha gave me all this. If Buddha can control everything about you, you are the Buddha now. Because you don't have to do anything. He can make you the Buddha. You cannot. The Buddha can only tell you that's the road to walk. That's the road to walk from A to B. He cannot walk it for you. If you're sitting there and you're not walking, you will never get to that point B. But the Buddha only tells you the method of walking there. So I'm going to talk about karma, especially previous life's karma, which you have to understand. People say, oh, how come I'm suffering now? It's unfair. It's not unfair. You are the result of what you have done in the past. You are just realizing the bad karma or the good karma, the wholesome karma or the unwholesome karma that you have done in the past. But there are ways to to correct it. There's a way to make up for it. That's what the Buddha was talking about. Don't just wait for things to happen. Don't just wait for suffering to come up. There are ways to avoid suffering. There are ways to manage sufferings. There are ways to understand suffering. That's the purpose of our talk. So we're going to talk about sufferings, and we'll be talking about happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. What is happiness? How to be happy. That's what we talk, talk about. That's in the first day. In the second day, we're going to do something practical. How to train the mind to overcome mental afflictions and to achieve your goals. Do you have goal to achieve? Everybody should have goal to achieve. How to train it, how to manage it. The second is, when you manage it, what are the methods? We're talking about mental stabilization. We call it samatha. And the right introspection, we call it vipassana, a Sanskrit word. And the meditation and satipatthana. Beware of emotional transfer. That is a very important concept in watching your own thought. 
I talked about it in the previous three days in my Chinese lecture in Chinese. By the way, anybody who, who, who participated in the, in the previous three days lectures, raise your hands. So uh, there are a fair number of people who also listen to the Chinese language talk. Third, the power of mantra and Buddha names chanting. Why should we chant? Why do we chant Namo Amitabha? Why do we chant Namo Kun Sempu? So why do we have to chant mantra? Well, there's a lot of meaning in it. It's not superstition. It's a sound therapy. Sound is very mystical. Sound is very effective. Sound is very inferential. We have to understand why we chant. It's not superstition. When your grandma and your mom and your dad are chanting, they may not understand why, but they are producing effects. They're producing good effects. All right, with understanding of what we're going to do for these two days, we don't want to waste any time. I come all the way from Vancouver and I come all the way from Hong Kong and I'm, going to, I'm also going to Thailand. You're going to get the message on how to manage your mind. Imagine yourself as a company. You are the CEO of the company. What are these front-end salesmen and sales lady? You know what salesmen and sales lady. They need to be supervised. So that's a manager, which is a sixth consciousness. And also, behind the manager, there are also other people. It's called a board of directors. The board of directors is the seventh consciousness, which is the personalized ego consciousness. They don't care. They just quite care about the profit. They personalize everything in the company. I don't care how you work. I don't care how you manage. You just have to raise the stocks, the shares of the company. We are the directors. And then what is a liar consciousness? The liar consciousness is the conglomerate wholeness of the company, which includes the shareholders outside, the directors, the, the, the you know, CEOs, the whatever. How to manage your life? Everybody, I manage the company well, but can you manage your, your life well? Some people manage the company successfully, making billions of dollars, but they, they couldn't manage their own family. Have you heard of stories like that? Why can't you do both? Okay, let's start. Now, the objective of my talk this evening is to introduce to you one of the many schools of the Buddhist teaching in Sanskrit language. It is known as Mujnapti Matrata Vada, which is mind only. Wei Shi Zhong, Ye Ming, Fa Xiang Zhong, Ye Ming, Yi Xie Heng Pai, or Mujnana Vada, Consciousness School. So Buddhism is not just about kneeling down, prostration, burning your incense, and then chanting your, your mantra. It's about understanding the mind, your mind. When you're understanding your mind, you will understand other people's mind because you will care about people's mind, other people's mind. It is an inferential tradition of the Buddhist philosophy and psychology emphasizing the study of cognition, Perception and consciousness. Students of psychology would know what I mean. Cognition, perception, and consciousness. It teaches us how to understand the functions of our mind and practice to subdue and purify it to achieve peace of mind and eternal bliss. Do you like to have peace of mind? Let alone eternal peace, we want it. If you want peace of mind, if you don't understand your mind, how can you have peace? Happiness is not, does not come from wealth. It comes from peacefulness of the mind. It does not matter how much money you have. If you're not peaceful, you're not comfortable with the money or your fame. Should we start now? Okay, let's start. I'm trying to cram everything into a day. So you have to bear with the burden of understanding. You may not... You may not understand it. It's a cram course. This course probably will take about three months just to understand how the, mind's, how the mind works. But I cram it together. Let's see how much we can do, how much we understand it. We call it mental experience. Let's start with external environment. You are my external environment. Everything outside of me is my external environment. A cup 
even the dust, the particles in the air, you, everything external to me. The Buddha called it externalities, all external phenomena. The Buddha classified external environments into wu yun, zhao jian wu yun jie kong. Xin jing li nian guo mei you, zhao jian wu yun jie kong du yi che ku ge. Wu yun, the one objects, se, sound, sheng, smell, xiang, taste, wei, touch, zhu, shi sheng xiang wei zhu. That almost classify everything external. Objects, all the objects, which includes even the particles, the electrons, the protons, all these ob objects. Sound, and then smell, and then taste, and then touch. Touch is tactility, which means the interaction in your body. Your internal body organs are touching against each other, you know, each other and interacting with it. So that Wu Yun, the five scanters, cover every external and external environment. But can you use five categories to cover all? The Buddha tried to cover that in that way. Because it takes millions of years if we try to explain everything. So the five scanters. The eyes would interact with objects. The eyes can see objects, so you have eye consciousness. The ears listen to sound, all kinds of sound. If you don't have ears, how can you listen to sound? The nose interact to smell, and your tongue interact with the taste. Your body consciousness interact with touch. This touch doesn't mean just touching. It means all the organs inside of you, the interaction. Now, sensory organs is not the consciousness. Sensory organ, the eye sensory organ, see something outside, con the eye consciousness arises. Because the organ itself has no consciousness. It is a tool. The camera is just to snapshot it. The camera is just a tool. The, your eyeball is just a tool. Your ear a drum is just a tool. But you need the internal interactions to understand what you see, what you listen to. So, when eyes, ear, nose, tongue see something, interact with something, that is perception. You perceive. Perceive is not just with eyes, with the ears, with the nose. Also, we call it perception. Qian wu shi. The front end five consciousness through the five sensory organs. And then, all images of past, present, and future. Cognitive process, that means the first five sensory front end sensory organs, they only interact with the present. The brain interacts with the past. Only the brain can think about yesterday. Your nose cannot think about yesterday. Your eyes cannot see yesterday. So only the brain, the sixth consciousness, can visualize and imagine yesterday. And the sixth consciousness can also predict think about the future and the present. So the cognitive process includes not just the present perception, but also the past. Plan for the future, recollect the past. That's your brain's function, including interpretation, rationalization of the perception. Now that belongs to cognition, which is the sixth consciousness, the manager. The manager, the front-end salesmen, cannot dig into archive files. They are not allowed to. It's confidential. Only the manager would dig into the history of it, compare the budgets of it, and, and plan out everything. Look at the past, plan for the future. Only the, that's the cognition, the rationalization of it. When I see Mr. Chan, the eyes see Mr. Chan, my eyes cannot discern, is that Mr. Chen or Mr. Lee or Mr. Mr. Zhang? But when the eyes see fixed enough, then it reflects into my brain, which is the sixth consciousness. The sixth consciousness would take out the fire and say, oh, that's Mr. Chen and not Mr. Lee. This seems to be so simple. But if you don't understand this simple concept, you cannot learn 
which none of us much at all. When the Buddha talk about consciousness, the Buddha talk about it in detail. Sometimes it's amazing when you, how could a saint、um, knew about everything about mind? That's what it is. And then personalize the foregoing consciousnesses with a self, which is personalization and arousal of emotions. Who get angry? Your ego consciousness, working with your mano consciousness, your seven consciousness, which is the mana's consciousness, interact with mano. The seven and the six interact. You get angry. You get jealous. You got hatred, ignorance, fear, phobia, depression. If you dig into Google, they may not be in that detail. Only in Buddhist teaching. I, I try to summarize it. Summarize it into this. So this personalization, and then body plus mind, a diluted self in samsara, store of present and past karmic energy, and that belongs to the alaya consciousness. So in other words, you, me, we have eight consciousnesses, not just one. Eight. If you analyze it in detail, the five foregoing, the six. Managerial, the seven personalized ego, and the eighth storage. We have a huge garbage bin inside of us that store up all your garbage that you have thrown in since millions of lives ago. And we're slowly cleaning it up. The Buddha taught us how to clean up our garbage. This garbage we've been carrying this in many lives. We suffer. Imagine you're in the middle of a garbage tank. You suffer. You got to clean it up. Meditation is to purify it and clean it up. Is it easy to clean up? Absolutely difficult. But if you know how to, then you open the door, clean it up a bit, and close it. You don't get overwhelmed by it. You, when you get overwhelmed by it, you die. You cannot be overwhelmed by this garbage. Some people did. Get overwhelmed by all this, overwhelmed by bad and wholesome energy, bad and wholesome karma. All right, with that information, then we go forward. Now let's talk about more about how you store, store the consciousness. Our eight consciousness, a lie consciousness, store all the karmic energy, the bija. Bija is a very important word in the Chinese language. Is zhong zhi. The seeds. This is the front end, ears, nose, tongue, body, and then there's the mind, and then there's the ego center. Store consciousness, alive consciousness. What is it store up? It stores up all the bija, all the energy, wholesome energy, and unwholesome energy. Also, there is neutral energy. The nature of karma, the nature of the bija, it's classified into three: wholesome, which means good. Unwholesome, bad, and neutral, not wholesome and not unwholesome. That's to classify all the energy. Wholesome emotions, as an example, faith, joy, equanimity, diligence, guilt, no greediness, no hatred, no ignorance. Unwholesome energy, it's greediness, anger, ignorance. Arrogance, doubt, wrong views, secondary hatred, vengeance, vexation, jealousy, flattery, many, many more. In modern terms, we call it depression, sadness, bipolar, fear, phobia, despair, anxiety, helplessness, self-abasement, self-pity, panic, phobia, worry, nervousness, insecurity, ADHD. Laziness, social anxiety. Sometimes we fit in a little bit of all of these, and sometimes you you get more of one of these. All right. With that understanding about your own consciousness, let's venture into who we are. Do you understand yourself? Who am I? 我是谁 Where do I come from? Why do I 
go through all this samsara? Why do I have to get born into this world and then after a hundred years I die? Or sometimes we can die any moment, you know? We don't know. It's not just that you, you, you're born and then you only die when you're a hundred years old. People die young age, middle age, old age. Um, but who am I? If some people ask, can you tell me who am I? The Buddha said, you are body and mind. The physiological system that you have, and then your consciousness, which is your mind, your vichnana. Then what's the body? What is this physiological system that we have? We have the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the body is further broken down into all the oil components, which is your hair, your nails, your teeth, your skin, your flesh, your bone structure, the liquid in the bones, your kidneys, your heart, your liver, your bladder, your spleen, your lung, you name it. Approximately 36 of these organs and elements. And when you involve into sensuous pleasure, you know what I mean by sensuous pleasures. You are just attached to the beauty of all these things. You are attached to the skin, the bone, the nose, the hair. That arouses your, your, your desire. And, but that's why you perform the, the relationship, but actually you are involved with the love inclination for these things. It's nothing but these. That's your body. And when we talk about the mind, it's, of course, the vision, the hearing, the smell, the taste and touch, which brings out first, second, third, fourth, five, which nana, the consciousness. And then we have the cognition, which is the sixth consciousness, the ego consciousness, the seven consciousness and the storage consciousness. So this is just a regurgitation of what I talked about just a few minutes ago, but in a few minutes ago I talked about it from the perspective of consciousness, and in this minute I'm talking about from the perspective of both physiological system and consciousness. We are a combination of body and mind. And when conditions fulfill, this body and mind works. But this body and mind, in the Buddhist language, is sunyata, is empty, is of no essence, is insubstantial. You just attach to them. You attach to them and you are in samsara. But we don't know about them. We've been attached to all these since many, many, many lives ago. Not only we attach to our own body and our own mind, we also attach to fame, reputation, money, wealth. You attach to all kinds of things. We, not just you, we all together, you and I. So I was in the middle of the world, I was using Bai Ju Yi, a Jesus, Pi Pa Hang. We are the same in the world, we are the same in the world, we are the same in the world. 我们沦落在哪里啊？沦落这个三界六道轮回啊！你跟我啊，其实老实说啊，都是可怜人，就是沦落在三界六道轮回啊！你下一生还要轮回的，我们呢、啊，下一生还要轮回的。所以 ，the Buddha two thousand six hundred years ago being born into this world and tell and told us a secret. Get out from here. Don't be NKD anymore. You can get out. Do you want to get out? Or are you so comfortable in your comfort zone? I don't want to get out. I don't want to get out. I'm so comfortable. We're all feeling comfortable. But when the Buddha, the saint, and the arahats, and the Buddhist satwas look at us, they pity us. They wanted to save us. Guan Yin Pusa wanted to save us. Dijang Pusa wanted to save us, and because they know that we are suffering. Of course, we have fleeting happiness. That is, happiness is Wu Chang. Why do we have mental afflictions? Because our consciousness is attached to external objects. 
Attachment is habitual thinking that occupies the mind. During the attachment, concurrent mental functions arise simultaneously to disrupt our inner peace. We may be feeling very peaceful inside. Now, for example, I'm feeling very peaceful now, or when you're at home, and then somehow something happened. Uh, your wife came home with a problem from work, and you started to have disgruntled behavior. He was yelling at you. And then your, your kids coming back from school, he had a bad day, and all these mental afflictions work out, and you don't feel happy. Because we get our mind occupied with this. Everybody attached to external externalities, and then they have concurrent mental functions arise simultaneously to disrupt your inner peace. You don't get peaceful. Due to habitual attachment, our mind becomes set on predetermined thoughts. When we talk about mental afflictions, funnel, most of the mental afflictions come from what? Come from family problems. We have more mental afflictions arising in the family than in the company. Because you can quit if you don't like the company. Can you quit your family? That's what we call a divorce. But there are some responsibilities you cannot quit. If you are the father of a few kids, can you quit it? The problem is you cannot quit your mental afflictions at home. You can quit your company. And sometimes you can't even quit your company because they can sue you too. It's not a peaceful world. Due to habitual attachment, our mind becomes set on determined thoughts. These thoughts can create uncontrollable reactions. Anger, jealousy, sadness, inferior complex or sensual in indulgence that perpetuate our problems and sufferings in life. Attachment to desires arising from greed, hatred, and ignorance lead us to samsara, life and death reincarnations. It seems that we are very pessimistic. We are always talking about problems. No. It is because life is pessimistic that we can improve. When the Buddha told us that the world is full of suffering, he was not being pessimistic. He told us to get out actively, optimistically, get out from it. Get out from the pessimistic situation. Leave. Don't get into this samsaric world. The reason why Buddha was so great a saint is because he told us that this world is not a world to live in. And he introduced many methods to get out. That is in Buddhist literature. All right, let's carry on with this. Where do emotions come from? Emotions come from your own karmic energy. Karma is energy expressed through thoughts, actions, and speeches. Every thought produces energy. Every speech produces energy. Action also produces energy. When the action is performed, when the words are spoken, when the thought comes out, the energy already is created. You can get away with it. So be, you be very careful with your own thought. For every karmic energy, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Sometimes it could be more than equal. For example, for every thought of hatred or loving kindness that arises in your mind, there is an equal amount of hatred or loving kindness that eventually returns to us. If you are involved in a dispute, you push someone, your energy goes out. And when you push someone, Actually, that force is also pushing you back because you're pushing some energy, but you hold your energy. That's the reason why it didn't fall. Actually, the, the energy bounces back to you. And um, when I was in Hong Kong just a few days ago, I met a, a youngster, and that youngster was really a very good, a kind youngster. And he, he, he said, he, he told me, yeah, I know, in Buddhism, it says that Whatever you do, there's always the same effect produced, so you have to be very careful. So I always be very careful with myself with what I'm doing. Well, that's the youngster that has very good thought about it. So if you, if you, 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 you give out compassion, you get compassion back. You give out 
hatred, you get hatred back. So don't give out any hatred. Don't give out any, um, I don't know, depressive attitude, anger, jealousy. Don't spread your COVID or don't spread your emotions around. Emotions can be contagious. We'll come to that later. Where do emotions come from? Come from karma. From whom your present life karma and your past life karma. Our karmic energy has been accumulating from one life to the next as we continue to experience rebirth. So everyone is different. Every one of our future, your life, every life is different. Even a, a twin, they may look alike outside, but their karmic energy is not the same. For information about reincarnation, please refer to studies made by a very famous person called Professor Ian Stephenson. He studied reincarnation his whole life. He conducted more than thousands of cases. He traveled around the world, India, Asia, America, studying reincarnation. Because some people may not believe in reincarnation, but he studied actual cases about reincarnation. You can research into his work about reincarnation. Karma. What is karma? Karma, action produces karma, speech produces karma, and thought produces karma. So if we break it down into bad karma and good karma, bad karma, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, intoxication, etc., etc. The list is inexhaustible. It's so long. Bad karma is so long, but I just mentioned a few examples. Good karma, renounce killing, protect lives, renounce stealing, practice generosity, give up sexual misconduct, practice and discipline. That's about the action. How about the speech? Bad karma, lying, immoral language, slandering, gossiping, flattery, etc., etc. So watch your mouth, they say. <laughs> that goes the saying, watch your mouth. Good karma, telling the truth, abandon your harsh words, speak pleasantly. That's speech. Thought, bad karma, greediness, hatred, anger, just the thought. Jealousy, cruelty, arrogance, vengeance, deceiving, egotistic, wrong views. Good karma, renounce greediness, being generous, compassionate, honesty, and harmony. Just give you some examples as to what is good karma, what is bad karma. And you watch your, you watch your, your action, your speech, and your thought. They produce the karma, and who is going to be the sufferer of the karma? You yourself. You think when you convey the bad karma out, you think that person to which you convey the bad karma suffer? Finally, it bounces back to you. Multifold. You give out, the effect will multiply and it comes back to you. What are the emotions? Unwholesome emotions and wholesome emotions. You don't have all my notes. You may have some and you may not. I only have certain. You don't have everyone. But this will be on YouTube too. By the way, how many people sometimes watch my YouTube? We, we meet in the air. Yeah, yeah. Quite a, quite a few, quite a few, yes. I have quite a few um, YouTube presentations. And, uh, but most of my presentations are in Cantonese and in Putonghua. Huayu, Huayu, Guangdonghua, is out door, those are Guangdonghua. Rules in this Guangdong, the Hantong Guangdonghua, the Hantong, she went in Guangdonghua. Yeah, Huayu, the Yeo. English, yes, too, yes, that's English. Unwholesome emotions and wholesome emotions. Greediness. Lust, desire, infatuation, anger, rage, hostility, 
hate, resentment, dislike, ignorance, depression, sadness, despair, anxiety, self abasement, etc., etc., and the wholesome emotions. Joy, basically, joy and love. Joy is, of course, classified into happiness, cheerfulness, jubilation, elation, etc., etc. Enthusiasm, optimism, pride, sense of dignity, and all that. And love is caring and compassion. Now, there are emotions. There are good and bad emotions. Not all emotions are bad. Sometimes you have good emotions. But even good emotion is fleeting. Negative emotions lead to mental disorder. You watch your emotions. Depression, anxiety, sadness, despair, rage, fear, suspiciousness, autism, self-pity, self-condemning, jealousy, hatred, and all these originate from ego attachment. And then mental disorders adverse effect your health, your family, job, studies, marriage, career, business, public relations. Simply, they affect every aspect of your whole life. Your emotions, 烦恼啊 affect the whole life. 最多的烦恼是家庭的烦恼。为什么有家庭的烦恼啊？基本上有两个重点，一个就是绝望。指望，另外一个是同住。指望是什么 ？Expectation. The son expects the dad something, and the dad expects the son to be. Oh, I want son. I want you to be a doctor. I want you to be a, 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 a professor. I want you to be too much expectation. I expect you to treat me good. I expect you always be loving kindness to me. But he never consider himself giving loving kindness out. Too much expectation, and they live together. If they have no expectation and they don't live together, no problem. Less problem, I would say, less problem. Do you find that? Liang Wang Chan, you 拜过梁王禅吗？梁王宝禅拜过梁王宝禅的举手。有很多人拜梁王宝禅。你拜梁王宝忏的时候啊，梁王宝忏里面有一卷是专专讲家庭的烦恼，讲得很清楚，什么是绝望，什么是同住。Why do emotions arise? Because we cannot let go. Our senses habitually attach to external objects, arousing wholesome and unwholesome emotions. Senses being the eyes, ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. Externalities: matter, sir, sound, sound, smell, uh, uh, is sound, sound, wei, chu, fa. When the eyes see matter, vision, seeing and sensual object arousing sensual desire. That's the consciousness and attachment. When a man、uh, sees a lady, and a lady sees a, 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 a man, and if you like. There's a there's a, a likeness among them. It's also a, a, a sensual、uh, feeling would come out. And when your ears, when you're being insulted, arousing anger, you feel angry. Being complimented, you feel very、uh, delightful. It's habitual inclination. When you're being insulted, you don't like it. When be, you are being complimented, you feel very delightful. Nose. Interact with smell, resenting pungent odor and attaching to fragrant smell. Your tongue interact to taste, indulging in meat eating, leading to animal slaughtering. Your tongue habitually attached to eating the flesh and blood of animals. That's why you eat the chicken, the pork, the cow, the beef. You like. To taste the flesh and blood of animal, you don't care about slaughtering them. Some people will slaughter them for you, but if you have been to to slaughtering houses, you won't eat beef again. You know how they slaughter the cows. I've been to those, those places, and and they when when they push the buffaloes in, they have a long alley which is just fit one buffalo. So thousands of buffaloes are going into one alley, and at the end of the valley, there's a barrel. 
the barrel, when the, when, the, when the buffalo goes into the barrel in the slaughterhouse, the barrel will open up like that. And then they push the buffalo in and they close it up with four holes for the legs to come down. With four holes. And then, and then they lift up the buffalo. Should I tell you something like that? Would it be too, uh, uh, too, too terrible? Is it okay? Raise your hands if you feel okay. Yeah, then I can continue. So that barrel catches the, the, the buffalo, and, and then it carries it through. And then when it reaches a certain point, then underneath the barrel, there is an edge like about one inch. And when it goes through that, there's a knife, a saw coming down. And they immediately saw into the barrel. So that means the, the buffalo is being sliced underneath the belly. And at that time, the, the buffalo don't even know about it. It slides through it, 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 the belly. And then when it goes into another section, it slowly opens up. And then all the bowels come down. And then, and then when it lands on, onto the other side, the buffalo still walk for about 10 feet without anything inside. And then they're struggling, struggling in pain. That's how they kill buffaloes. They kill buffaloes in two minutes. That's the new way of killing them. You know how they kill the chicken? They just hang the chicken upside down. There is, and it goes through in, 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 a, in a mass assembly line. And they can kill thousands of chicken in, in, in five minutes. They don't care about animals suffering. But your, your, your tongue likes to taste it. That's why they want to sell them to you. You buy them. You, you, you like the taste. You like the beef, a sirloin steak, New York steak. You like hamburger. You like pork chops. You like fish. You know how the fish were being killed? You should be a vegetarian starting from tomorrow. <laughs> Would you? For the sake of not killing all these animals. There are more and more people. There are more and more vegetarian restaurants. I'm not advertising to, for them. Two days ago, I went to Lingji. That was really good. Excellent food in there. Have you been there? Raise your hands if you've been there. I'm not advertising for, for, uh, for Lingji, but they really have very good vegetarian and, and Lin Sum and all that. And even Sun Fat Kai and even Fat Yao Yun. I've been all those places. For, because I've been here for a few days already. So you don't need to eat meat because you're habitually attached to eating meat. That's why they kill them for you. And that's why you accumulated all this bad karma. What is, what is the causality of always killing and eating animal, killing animal for food? Bad health, short life. If you start to be a vegetarian from now on, you will live long. Okay, let's carry on. So, body, touch, tactility, attaching to material luxuries arising habitual greediness. Almost all of us like luxuries. You may not know that you like luxuries. You like to drive good cars. You like to enjoy yourself in a nice home. You like nice clothes, shoes. You like all these. Before Buddha became a monk, the Buddha was a prince. And he, had, he enjoyed all the luxuries in life. His father, the king, built four palaces for him. His name is Siddhartha Gautama. Later became Buddha Sakamuni. He had four palaces, the four seasons. Not a four season hotel, but a spring, autumn, summer, winter. Four seasons, palaces. And he enjoyed himself in the four seasons palaces, but he didn't like the luxuries. He wanted to be free. But it, right now, everybody is struggling for more money, for, wealth, for, for big houses, driving good cars, luxuries. Where is this man, the prince? He renounced all these luxuries and tried to become an ascetic, what is in pursuit of 
methods of enlightenment, methods of helping himself and all sentient beings to get away from samsara. So don't look for all these luxuries. They're not worth. Even, even the prince had all these luxuries. He gave it up. He didn't like it. Because that is not the way to go in life. Because all luxuries are fleeting. You cannot bring all your luxuries with you when you die. You cannot even bring your own body with you when you die. It does not matter how good you are, how many luxuries you, ha- you are. You cannot bring a penny. You cannot bring your bank book deposit. You cannot bring anything in your safety deposit boxes. No matter how many jewelries you have, diamond rings you have, you cannot bring them with you. But there's one thing you can bring with you. You have to, to bring with you. That's your own karma. What you have done when you are alive. Don't do any bad deeds anymore. They count. How how come I don't know? Who is responsible for keeping a record of my karmic energy? I don't believe it. I don't. I don't think so, because whatever I done, nobody. I, nobody knows about it. I did it secretly. I've been doing these bad deeds. I had a lot of one night stands. I have a lot of uh, girlfriends or boyfriends. I've done all these things. Nobody knows. Not even my mom. Your mom, your dad, they don't know. But one thing, no, is similar to a computer. When you key in the information in there, it gets into your memory. That's your eight consciousness. Your keyboard is the front end five sensory organs. Your sixth sense is your programming. All this gets stored into your memory, and your memory is like the cloud. It, it get all stored. It won't go away. For every bad thought you have, it's in the cloud. It's in your consciousness. For every good thought you have, it's also in there. Don't think about bad things. It's also good for you if you're positively knowing how to make up good thoughts. So the Buddha is a positive thinker. The Buddha helped us to build up good thoughts and lead to samsara. What's the difference between ascension being and a Buddha? Ascension being is not enlightened. He is attaching to externalities, where the Buddha has already awakened from the dream of existence. This sentient being is living in a dream of existence, and he doesn't know about it. The Buddha tells us that what he has gone through, and what he has gone through is all written in the three canons: Jing, Lu, Lun. The Sutra, Sastra, and Abhidharma. Jing, Lu, Lun. How many? As much as the ocean, thousands of volumes, billions of words. As to give an example,、uh, in the previous three days, there's so much in the Buddha's teaching since two thousand to six hundred years ago, an accumulation of all the Buddha's teaching. We cannot learn it all. It's like the ocean. We cannot learn it all, but we don't have to learn everything. When you want to taste the taste of the ocean, you don't need to drink up the whole ocean. You just like me get a cup and then scoop up some water and taste it. Oh, then you know the taste of the ocean. You don't need a Buddha knew so much. I don't know anything. How can I get enlightened? No. As long as you get a cup and scoop up water and drink it. You know how it tastes. This is the water of a certain sutra. This is the water of something. And if you get all the, if if you know how to realize the taste of it, then you know how to walk to the road of nirvana. If somebody asks me what is Buddhism, if you're only allowed to say one word, what do you want in Buddhism? How do you what do you try to get in Buddhism? If you take think about getting nirvana. Have you heard of Nirvana? Any anybody heard of Nirvana? What is Nirvana? Nirvana is a Sanskrit word. In the Chinese language, it's translated into Nirpan. 
Nirpans, Nirvanas. What is Nirvana? Nirvana literally means blowing out the flame, extinguish the other flame. That means extinguish all your mental afflictions. Stop your cycle of reincarnation. You stop, you blow out the flame, the flame of bad karma. You blow it out and you get into Nirvana, get into out of samsara. And it also means cessation. It means all that is bad cease, no more. And then you go to that land where you have eternal bliss. You're away from samsara. Okay, let's carry on. Okay. Concomitant mental functions. I'm, I'm trying to get into some psychology now. When a thought comes up, when your eyes, your ears, your nose, when your front-end salesman interact with the outside world, your eyes see, your, e your, your ears listen to sound, you taste everything, all these things. There are five generally in interactive functions arising at the same time. And we call it attention, contact, sensation, perception, and volition. Whenever every thought comes up, this generally interactive functions automatically come up. Otherwise, there will be no thought. What is attention? If I'm looking at something, I'm not paying attention, I don't know what I see. When you have attention to it, if my eyes don't get in contact with the object, I don't know what it is. And also I have sensation, I have perception, I have volition. Now that I'm not going to explain it in detail. You have to study with Nanamatrata in detail so that you know every, every word. As I said, I'm giving you a cram course. What does this tell us? You have five general, generally interactive functions. That means when a thought comes up in you, all these features at the same time comes up. If these features comes up in the right way, then you'll be going in the right direction. For example, if I'm a student, I'm listening to a professor giving a lecture. If I'm not paying attention, I'm not going to learn. If I don't contact, I'm not going to learn. If I don't have a feeling of how that affects me, I'm not going to learn. So if you focus on it, the power comes from the focus. So if you're a student at school that you know, if you're always paying attention, you'll be a good student. If you know how to manage it, then you'll get better results. If you have attention, contact, sensation, perception, and volition, you produce better results, especially if you're going in the right way. But if you're going in the wrong way, it, it produces wrong, wrong effects. So you've got to have general interactive functions ex being exercised in the right way. How to do it, it takes a whole, it takes a three semesters to, to, to discuss about all this. Concomitant mental functions take a year to understand. I'm only giving you a, a very general concept. And then you have particular functions. Desire, resolve, mindfulness, concentration, and intelligence. Five of them. What does this mean? This means your particular functions, if it come up in you, it helps you to perform. If you have desire to go to the university, if you have the desire to get an A, if you have that desire strong enough, you get an A. If you have resolve, that means you always remember that you'll be doing that. If you are mindful, if you have concentration, if you have intelligence. So whatever you do in your company, in your life, if you know how to manage your particular functions of your mind, which you have, you'll be more successful in life. So I always suggest that Buddhism should be taught to young people. Because when they are young, they, they, if they know how to pay attention, how to build up desire to do something, how to concentrate, how to increase the mindfulness, they'll be more successful. How? The Buddha told us. That's the wonders of Buddhism. It teaches, me, it teaches us how to achieve better in whatever you're doing, in your goal. Not just about incense and prostrations and bow and no, not just that. That's your grandmom, your granddad, not you. And then there's uh, unwholesome functions. At the same time, there are bad guys coming in your mind. You have 
root 烦恼，贪嗔痴慢疑恶见，骄喘狂妒忌，昏沉，很多很多，有二十六个。你不好的 ，imagine that your body is a parliament, a British parliament, for example, and in the parliament there are ministers. Some ministers are good, some ministers are bad. You have twenty-six very bad ministers in your mind, which always help you to perform bad deeds, bad words. You don't know about it. They're helping you to do bad things. They will say, "Okay, you should be depressive now. You should be angry now. You should be jealous now. He's insulting you. You fight back. You it, it, they're martyrs. You have it. You have twenty-six of them in your mind." Which you don't know. Now, all these generally in a, in interactive functions and particular functions, they are neutral. If you use them in the right way, you'll be successful. If you use them in the wrong way, you fail. If you use general and the particular in the right way, you become a saint. You become a good person. But if you use them to be a bad person, it helps you to be a bad person. So they are neutral. But these unwholesome functions—they're not neutral. They are your opposition ministers. They are really bad, but you also have wholesome ministers. Only eleven. In your parliament of your mind, there are eleven ministers helping you to be good, and twenty-six ministers helping you to be bad. They are the majority. Very scary. You may not even know about it. And then there are four indeterminate functions: regret, drowsiness, investigation, and security. They are not determined. For example, in regret, they could be good, it could be bad. I'll give you an example. I come to this temple, and then, oh, I have a mind of generosity. I want to donate ten thousand dollars. I'm so moved by whatever I see. I feel peaceful. I feel happy. I'm going to donate ten thousand dollars. And then when you go home, gee, ten thousand dollar, it's a whole month of my salary. Why am I so stupid? You feel regret. You did something right, but you feel regret. So that's a bad regret. On the other hand, there's another person. And he did something wrong. He feel regretful. That's a good regret. You did something wrong. You feel regretful. You feel wrongful. So whenever someone come up to to you to say, "I have done done something wrong," would you excuse me? You don't say, "I don't excuse you." You try to make up rooms for him to to change. So regret could be good, could be bad. So there are four of them. So all together, how many? You have fifty-one mental functions in your mind, helping to in your, in your daily thinking, helping you do good things and bad things. You be very careful with them. Unwholesome mental functions: twenty-six. Roots: greediness, anger, ignorance, arrogance, doubt, and false views. And then you have primary disbelief, laziness, indolence, thoughts wandering, torpor, forgetfulness, distraction, false understanding, and also you have shamelessness, no guilt. You also have hatred, vengeance, vexation, jealousy, harm, parsimony. You are not generous. Your pride, your concealment, flattery, and deceiving. You have twenty-six bad ministers in your parliament of thinking. Working to help you to do bad things, making you very, very unhappy. And these ministers are very strong. And then there's a the good, wholesome functions: ministers, faith, diligence, calm, equanimity, modesty, shame, non-greed, non-hatred, absence of delusions, harmlessness, and vigor. You have these good ministers in you too, but they are very weak. That's the reason why every everybody's personality is different. 
What builds up a person's personality? How does it start? It starts with a thought. He has a thought of hardworking thought, good thought. He always has that thought. If a thought is repeated and repeated and repeated all the time, it becomes what? It becomes a habit because it's repeated all the time. When a, cer- a certain habit is repeated all the time, all the time, it becomes your personality. When your personality is repeated, repeated all the time, it becomes your terrible destiny, or could be fantastic destiny. So you are the creator of your own life. Don't blame your mom, mom and dad. Don't blame anybody. Don't blame God. Don't blame the Buddha. You are. The creator of your own life. Your life is in your own hands. From today on, you're going to change. You're going to realize what what are the bad mental functions, what are the good mental functions. You train your wholesome functions, and you try to reeducate your unwholesome functions and make it good. What is happiness? Happiness is a feeling of contentment. A state of the mind. It is not a long-lasting, permanent feature, but a fleeting, changeable state. But happiness is very difficult to define. It is a very subjective thing. A woman who is divorced and who has five or six nieces, nieces and nephews, and living together, she feels happy because she told us that she is free. She always beat up by, his, by her own husband. And now she's free, and she still feels happy. A man who is a who is a millionaire, a good family, he is absolutely unhappy, because why? He wanted to be a billionaire. A businessman with twenty billion, he feels unhappy, because his friend has a private jet airplane. He doesn't have one. A lady. Whose husband is making a few millions per year, and he's unhappy because his other friends' husbands make more. So, what is happiness? Happiness is no definition. It's very subjective. Happiness is difficult to define because we don't know what true happiness is. Some people identify happiness with sensory pleasure. But such pleasure is different from happiness, as pleasure is only a sensory feeling. Many people identify happiness as relationship between a man and a woman. In that moment of happiness, that's not happiness. That's a sensory stimulation. That's not happiness. A lot of bad effects may flow out of it. It's a momentary feeling we get from experiences such as eating food, good food, getting a relaxing massage, or receiving a compliment, or even from a sexual encounter. You think that's happiness? That may bring out a lot of problems. Homicide can come out because of that that encounter. Many many things may come out from it. But you think that's happiness, right? What did the Buddha say about happiness? When the Buddha gave his first Dharma talk, he did not talk about how to get happiness, but instead how to overcome unhappiness, such as mental afflictions and various adversities. So he talked about the four noble truths: sufferings, causes of suffering, methods to end suffering, cessation of suffering, 苦执灭道 That's a study in the Harvard Business case. You identify the problems. You analyze causes of the problem. Suffering is to identify the problem. All these sufferings. You don't have sufferings. We have lots of tough suffering. We'll, we'll go. We'll go through it. Five minutes later, we identify what these sufferings. That means we identify the problems. When we were given a case by a professor in Harvard, for example, school, here is a case. You study it. And you resolve that. So, what do you do? And when you receive that, sometimes a hundred pages of information about a company and you how to resolve this problem, you go through it and try to find out the problems. 
identify the problems, and then once you identify the problems, you analyze the causes of this problem. Why this company have that kind of problems? And then, then, then what? And then you find out methods to overcome, methods of solutions to solve those problems. And when the problems are resolved, that's the final fruits of your project. So the, the Four Noble Truths is actually very analytical, very ed educational. But when people look at the Four Noble Truths, they don't look at it that way. From now on, you know. But the Buddha helps us to solve our problems. The Fourth Noble Truth, suffering. What kind of sufferings we have? Sickness, aging, death, death of loved ones. When we were born as a baby, that you're one year old, for example, and, and then you're up to 100 years old, you die. So your, your past, it's when you were a baby. Your future, at 100 years old, you die. Anybody here who does not have to die, you raise your hand. You don't have to die, you raise your hand. So from being birth to death, say 100 years, what is in between? Sang shi, right? Sang shi. Limian, lao bing. Do you get old? Raise your hand if you don't have to get whole old. I would never get old, no matter how much cosmetics you put on, how, many, how much facial you can do. Sometimes when, when, I was in the, when I was in the temple, because I know a lot of Buddhists, and if I haven't seen a, a lady or a man for a number of years, when I see them again, it's different. You put on weight, you know, mainly you, you become, you, you put on weight and, and you have wrinkles all over the place you know, on your faces. So birth and death, in between is aging and sickness. Death of loved ones, living with hated ones, that's a kind of suffering. You're living with hated ones. In a family, you don't like your in-laws, but you have to live with them. That is suffering too. Insatiable desires, mental afflictions, suffering arising from the five scanters, natural disasters, social unrest and changes, international wars and so on, COVID, epidemic diseases, contagious diseases. How many die? How many people die? In the Second World War, 40 million people die in the war. In Rivada, in Africa, in the 19, 1997, within three months, 800,000 brothers and sisters of a different tribe, the same country, kill each other. 800,000 people get killed. In the Holocaust, six million Jews were executed. All these are not suffering. Terrible suffering. Sometimes I, I don't want to talk about this, otherwise you can't go to sleep tonight. Causes of suffering, karma, such as insatiable desires, craving, ignorance, hatred, ego attachment, arrogance, suspicion, erroneous views, and many other mental afflictions. Sometimes I don't understand why some people can, can exercise so much cruelty on others. Unimaginable. All this information is easily accessible since we have we can do it online and Google, or in many, many sources we can get information. There's so much bad karma has been created. I think we should all go to the Pure Land. That's the reason why in the previous three, three uh, days, I talk about how to be reborn in the Pure Land. The Four Noble Truths, cessation of suffering, sufferings can be ended through a complete understanding and practice of the Buddhist teaching. Nirvana can only be understood or realized through direct experience. Nirvana means peace, sublimity, purity, liberation, eternal happiness, extinction of craving, hatred, ignorance, and so on. Cessation of suffering. The path leading to cessation of suffering. The Buddha didn't even only talk about causes of suffering. He introduced methods to end suffering. Do you have any time to study that? 
you have time to to do other things. As I always mention, you have time to WeChat, WhatsApp for three, four hours, but you don't have any time to learn something about what the Buddha was telling us. From now on, don't do too much with WhatsApp. Get one hour to understand one of the Four Noble Truths, one of the paths leading to the cessation, the elimination of suffering. Through practicing the Buddha's teaching, what's the Buddha's teaching? So much. I can't tell you in one night. I can't cram in the one night. No way. I've been studying for 50 years, and I'm still, I'm still learning. But I'm amazed at so much information you can learn from the Buddha's teaching. Qing Lu Lun. Hao Ru Yan Hai. The whole ocean of literature. You know, the most the most abundant literature in Buddhism is the Chinese Buddhism, Hanwen Fu Xue. Why is Hanwen Fu Xue so abundant? Two thousand six hundred years ago, there were many translations of many Qing literature. From Chinese to Chinese, from India to India, from China to China, 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 那个时候，法显大师要到要到印度去 study 留学。那个时候他六十三岁，他六十三岁从长安出发，经过丛林，经过五年的危险的旅途啊，到了印度求学佛法。开始的时候有十个人去的，到的目的地只有两个人成功，一部分不去了，太辛苦了；另一分一部分呢，在沙漠死掉了。他们为什么？他们要求到佛法带回中原。Can I speak 普通话 ？No problem. I cannot translate that into English. My mother tongue is not English. Yes, I can, but it takes too much time. And 还有，还有那个他学了八年，玄奘大师，唐唐三藏，唐朝，他经过三年危险危险的旅途。到了印度学了十七年呐、啊，天天学习啊，完了以后带很多经论回回中原，还有易净大师，他没有经过丝绸之路，他是从海去，在海漂流了三年，到印度学了十八年，所以我们那么多方夫啊，都是前人呐、啊，用他们的生命回来的佛经佛典，你们有没有学啊？为什么你们不学啊？太浪费了，太可惜了。That's why I'm telling you, there's so much, and learning Buddhism not just help you to be reborn in in the Pure Land. It helps you to be successful in your present life because if you know how to solve your problem, find the causes of the problem, identify methods to solve this problem, you'll be a successful businessman. You'll be successful. You'll be successful in managing your family, managing your company, managing your thought, managing your life. Why don't you get into it? The Four Noble Truths indicate to us that if we can end all of our sufferings and get into a state called Nirvana, happiness naturally comes up. You do not have to look for it. You don't have to look for happiness. If your all sufferings are gone, that's already happiness. The Buddha emphasized that we do not have to crave for happiness if we can eliminate suffering, achieving equanimity or peace of mind by achieving a mental state where we can detach from all our emotions, such as greediness, anger, ignorance, arrogance, suspiciousness, and egotistic view. We can free ourselves from suffering and achieve a state of mind we call it eternal bliss and well-being. The Buddha said, "When there is no inner peace, there is suffering." I remember there was a a very rich man. I don't want to mention name. Probably the number one rich man in Hong Kong. Probably I don't want to mention name. He was interviewed by a reporter. A Mister So and So. You have been here for so many years, and you make so much money. What is happiness? Where do you? When do you get this happiness? You. His answer is. When I first came to Hong Kong, when I was licking this ice cream cone, I feel very happy. 
I feel very happy when I'm licking this ice cream cone, walking in the park, enjoying all the trees and the shrubs and the flowers. I feel extremely happy. Not with all the money. Peace of mind. Spring has flowers, autumn has leaves. Summer has cold air, winter has snow. Love is sensitive, wears on the heart. 便是人间好时节，你听过吗？什么是人间的好时节 ？The spring has flowers， 春有百花，秋有月。The autumn has the moon， 夏有凉风。In the summer we have the warm breeze， 冬有雪。In the winter we have snow white， the white snow。春有百花，秋有月，夏有凉风，冬有雪。若无闲事挂心心头，你以为春夏秋冬那么美吗？啊、很美啊，我的心态心态很好。其实最好的时节啊，不是最好的时节。若无闲事挂心头，我 my my mind has has no suffering in it. I have absolute peace of mind. I feel free. I feel nirvana. I feel I'm peaceful. That's the best season, not spring, autumn, winter. And summer, 若无闲事挂心头，便是人间好时节。Because you are all peaceful inside. There's suffering when you have no peace. Rebirth in the samsara by sentient beings, according to the good evil deed action in the previous life, we are in the realms of reincarnation. The three vicious realms is hell, hungry ghosts, and animals. The three wholesome rams: it's humans, devas, and asuras. One is responsible for rebirth. Karma. Your actions, speeches, and thinking of the past and present lives have all become latent energies for our sufferings and reincarnations. What is karma? Karma is an accumulation of actions of the body, speech of the mouth. And thoughts of the mind, we will reap what we have sown. We are the result of what we were, and we will be the result of what we are now. The Dharma says, "All that we are is the result of what we have thought, acted, and spoken." Karma is constantly working within the natural law of cause and effect. The pain and happiness we experience are the results of our own deeds, words, and thoughts reacting on ourselves. It is responsible for our prosperity and failure, our happiness and misery. There are three kinds of karma: wholesome and so wholesome and neutral. I already explained it. Karma also refers to the natural law of cause and effect. Karma is working. Your yin guo, yin guo, bao yin, ye li lun hui. Every thing has its own karma. You can't get out of the yin guo. No one knows. Your memory knows. The clouds know because it ought to get stored in there for every action, every thought. Good karma, good effect. Bad karma, bad effect. Neutral karma, neutral effect. Thoughts give rise to action and speech, because all actions and speech are pushed out by thought. If your action and speech get repeated all the time, it becomes a habit. So, if you have bad action and speech repeated all the time, you are building up bad habit. If your action and speech are good all the time, you are creating good habits. What kind of habits you want to create? If the habits are always repeated, it becomes your personality. Don't blame anybody. It's your own habits that got repeated all the time, and your personality determine your destiny. Do you want a good destiny? You go back to the origin. You watch your thought, watch your speech, and watch your actions. As I have mentioned, there are unavoidable sufferings: suffering of birth, aging, sickness, death; suffering of being up, apart from loved ones; suffering being together with despised one; suffering of not getting what one wants; suffering from the interaction of the five scantures. We need one whole session to discuss that. But I can tell you, these are unavoidable. 
You have all of these. These are unavoidable. And there are also uncontrollable sufferings. Sufferings that you cannot control arise from natural disasters, such as flooding, earthquake, hurricanes, tsunamis, volcano activities, epidemic diseases like COVID, wars, genocide, and social unrest and changes. Suffering arises from trying to control what is un uncontrollable or from neglecting what is within our power. Suffering arises from trying to control what is uncontrollable. Something you cannot control and you try to control it. Suffering comes up. Or if suffering comes up, you neglect the power within you to change. You have the power within you to eliminate suffering, but you neglect it. You continue the causes to build up suffering. From now on, you don't neglect the power within you. You have that power within you to change. Why don't you exercise and try to learn about this power? That's what the Buddha taught us. But suffering, such as mental afflictions, emotions are controllable as long as you have to manage your own thought, as long as we are not neglecting the power within us to manage our emotions. If we understand how to come about and follow the Buddha's teaching to overcome them, so we can change. We can manage these sufferings and eliminate them. And that's about what we'll be talking tomorrow night. How do we control them? How do we manage it? How do we get rid of the sufferings? I do want to come tomorrow night. We practice how to do it. Now we just empty talk about it. We just talk about it, but we never, we never learn how to, how to control it. How to exercise the power within us to control this suffering. How to eliminate suffering. But there are some un uncontrollable ones. But there are controllable ones too. So I'm going to stop at this point. And I don't know if I should, maybe I should answer some of these questions. There is consciousness in the 12 links of dependent origination. Is this the sixth consciousness, but does this consciousness in the 12 links relate to the eight consciousness? The 12 links of origination talk about how we start with ignorance and then we get reincarnated. When we were a child, when we were a teenager, when we were an adult, how, this, how our life evolved and broken down into 12 links of origination, the life evolving process. And in the life evolving process, of course, you exercise your consciousness. You're conscious when you are, when you are evolving in your life, right? But the 12 links of dependent origination talk about not only of the life evolution, it also talk about as fast as in the thought evolution. 12 links of origination spans the whole, whole life. 100 years, 90 years, but also about the thought 12 links of origination. So it concerns about consciousness. In your 12 links of origination, it's one thought is a 12 link origination. That, that takes a long time to explain. But that concerns about consciousness. Will you classify COVID as world karma, personal karma, sort of a... I will classify COVID as collective karma. That is individual karma and collective power, karma. And let me give you an example. If you have good karma, for example, if we are, we are in Singapore, we're enjoying a, a, a supermarket, a hospital. Everybody enjoyed that hospital. Everybody enjoyed that school or, or that supermarket or, or whatever, shops. Everybody can enjoy it. There's collective karma. You, you enjoy the benefits in Singapore. There's collective karma. However, in collective karma, there's also individual karma. Because some people, they are so poor that they may not be able to go out. They are so sick that they may not be able to go out to a supermarket. And they were so poor that they don't even have enough money for medicine. 
So your collective karma is what everybody enjoys, but your individual karma. In other words, in COVID, a lot of people get contracted with the COVID disease, but there are some who are very healthy. Their individual karma overcomes the collective karma. They are living in a collectively bad environment, but they still survive. So their individual karma overcome the bad collective karma. You understand what I mean? Yeah, okay. Recently, there were rats entering my house. Just thinking, is this relating to karma? Yeah, it's a bad karma. <laughs> yeah. Why is it a bad karma? Karma relates to thought, action, and speech, right? Do you have the action to clean up your house? You don't. Do you have the speech to tell your family members to be careful and cleaning up everything before they leave the house? You haven't done enough methods to stop the rats from entering the house. That is the bad karma. Thank you, Venerable. We are seeing more people converting to Christianity, especially the young generations. How can Buddhism turn the tide around? Unlike Buddhism, Christianity is not receptive and difficult to get along. How to stay cool? In uh, it's the natural. It's a, it's a natural cycle. Uh, 每一件事有它生住异灭。佛陀告诉我们，在很很多很多年以后，可能没有佛法了。最后的这本佛经是《阿弥陀经》。Everything is subject to changes. Even Buddhism. Everything is subject to disintegration. Even Buddhism. But after it's disintegrated, it come back again. Our world is summer, spring, winter, autumn. Everything subject to the changes. Our life subject to changes. So is Buddhism. If the Buddha said everything is subject to changes and I don't subject to changes, that's not logical. If I say everything is subject to changes, that means you yourself, your own body, is subject to changes, right? Buddhism is also subject to changes, but then it will come back again. Dear Venerable, may I ask if we are allowed to tell white lies, which are of good intention? Yeah, you can, as long as you're not hurting anybody. We call it expediency, 方便法门。我们有六度波罗蜜吗？不失其戒忍如静静禅定般若。那么从六波罗蜜里面产生方便波罗蜜、利波罗蜜、愿波罗蜜。治波罗蜜，方便波罗蜜就是怎么样呢？就是 expediency to give convenience to certain white lies that do not affect anybody。好像是你说有个朋友，你你你见那个朋友，朋友说我请你吃饭了，不要不要不要请我吃饭，我已经吃过了。其实你没有吃过饭，你不愿不愿意他花钱，那么我已经吃过了。那、这个是 white lie， 你是你是妄语吗？不过你不喜欢他浪费，你不喜欢花钱，你的心态好吗？这可以的。Venerable me, I know where feeling fits into the scheme of things. Feeling is your perception, your per perception and conception, and a little bit of collision. That's your feeling. The feeling fits into uh, into your A combination of your first five consciousnesses and the mano, managerial consciousness. That's the feeling. 四条的答答完了。我告诉你，我还我还可以很详细的答答回答你的问题。没有时间了。我很喜欢回答问题的。我回答问题，我一看我就啊，问题很好，我就回答你了。Yeah, I don't select the the very good question to answer. I like to answer every question. If the three lovers' ram consists of hell, hungry goats and animals, why are there still roaming spirits around? Aren't they supposed to go to hell? <laughs> yeah, some of them are hell, and some of them, even though not victims of hell, living in this is like victims of hell. People are suffering some more, being cheated, and being, I don't know. Some people are suffering in certain corners of the world that they are. They're being tortured, and they're living in hell. Hell is not just really go down hell too. In this world, we have a lot of hells in this world. So we want to get it, get out from it. 
what is the reason for which we pray and what does it mean to be open to revelation on this also that there's something divine within we'll give you an answer tomorrow when we talk about uh, prayer and chanting I have only two questions to go is samadhi meditation leads to our hardship liberation can venerable enlighten us on the heart sutra that takes about half a year (laughs) and why don't you get get on YouTube and um, Explain the Heart Sutra, it takes a long time. This is Chinese, it's made up. You are in the internet, I'm listening to the Bible on YouTube, and I'm still in the Bible, I'm still in the Bible, and 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 但净土法门却主主张观想念佛，请问这个观念如何理解呢？观想念佛比较困难，因为观想相是相嘛，凡所有相皆是虚妄，若见诸相非相即尽如来，所以你你还是念佛有四个方法，实名念佛、观想念佛、观想念佛。实相念佛，你就用齐名观念念佛就行了，就是念不要观，你不懂得观，你不要观。但是有时你的眼睛想阿弥陀佛庄严那个相貌可以的，你不用特意的观，你就天天念佛，念到一心不乱，你就会都摄六根，净念相继。你还要用依佛念佛的心态去念佛，你念出来就行了，不用观想，也不用不也不用观相，这个是印光法师教我们的。不是单是我讲的，念就行了。你这样念下去，你还有三要：信、愿、行，还有三心，纯一虚。你还有，你还有实现普贤十大愿望，《五经一论》，你要好好的读了。你根据它，你持名念佛就行了，不用观想，也不用观想。好，呃、uh, ，We would like to dedicate. The merits of these lectures to all beings who are suffering, and will be reborn in the pure land. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Venerable, for the inspired talk tonight. Please rise, everyone. Come together. Thank、you.